Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, Philip Lorray, a financial advisor and poet and a uh, writer on the web of Minute.org. Also, Jason McPhee, engineer at California, state of California. So welcome to the show. Uh, well, the bomb, the bombshell uh, arrived today or yesterday. The, the Fed did, in fact, do what they said they were going to do, and they ignored all of Trump's tweets, don't do that. They raised interest rates another whole quarter of a percent. Is that significant? It's catastrophic. Oh, what? Catastrophic. Wait a minute. Going to, from two, and a, two to two and a quarter is catastrophic? How is uh, that was, catastrophic? Yeah, two and a quarter to two and a half, and it was catastrophic. How? Uh, the first thing... Uh, the first thing it did is all of the economic signals have been going south. And they have been since two rate hikes ago. And it should be understood that uh, it takes about a year for rate hikes to actually cycle through the economy. So that when uh, uh, Fed Chair Powell made his comment on October 3rd that the interest rates were a long way from neutral, uh, at that point, most of the major averages were trading at their all-time high. Uh, from that point on, I just kind of made a list of all the things that are now officially in a bear market in the U.S. economy. Uh, a bear market being defined as down 20% more from their highs. In this case, we're talking about 20% or more from October 3rd. And so the speed of it has been incredible. Uh, oil is in a super bear market. It's down 40% from October 2nd. Uh, when we think about how pervasive oil is throughout the economy and what that means in terms of deflation to the rest of the industries. Uh, the banking sector is in a bear market, uh, down almost 30 percent. Uh, why? Because you've got higher interest rates at the short end, which is where the banks borrow, and sh lower interest rates at the longer the end, inverted yield the curve. inverted yield curve. So as soon as the market saw uh, an inverted yield curve, which had uh, happened the day after Thanksgiving. As soon as the market saw that, the market went straight south. Because we all know that what that indicates, uh, an inverted yield curve where interest rates are higher at the short end than the long end, has preceded each of the last seven recessions going back to World War II. It's the surest indicator we know. So every money manager said, okay, we see where this is going. Uh, the semiconductor index is in a bear market. Our technology. You know, it's not just the old smoke Intel section. and AMD. Uh, Intel, AMD, and you can go right down. Micron just destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go down the line. Uh, the Home Builders Index. Uh, yesterday is in a, a super bear market. Uh, yesterday they came out with the uh, existing home sales, and it looked almost okay in that it wasn't down. It's been down all year, except that uh, single-family homes were down 7% year over year. We are at uh, we're at very low levels in terms of unit sales. Uh, the Nasdaq went into a bear market today intraday, uh, closed 19.7 percent down. The small cap index, uh, the Russell 2000, in a bear market and has been was the first in a bear market. It's the most economically sensitive to just the U.S. economy. So this isn't the global economy affecting us. Uh, the transportation index. For those who believe in the old Dow theory. Transportations are confirming the industry. Whatever it is, it has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even if it's a chip, it has to go somewhere. And when the transportation index goes into bear market, that has been, uh, going back Dow theory, even before the S&P has been a sure sign that something is wrong in the economy. With all of that, the Fed took the stage with an already inverted yield curve and frankly acknowledged in his statement that, gee, the economy is softening, there are cross currents globally, all of this stuff. If you had just read the text, you would have said that he was reducing interest rates. Instead, he raised them. The market had priced that in, and that's why it was going down. But the reason it went down so hard over the next two days was that he continued to say, and we're going to do it some more. And this was just, it was quite simply, it was, uh, you know, anybody that has anything to do with any kind of business, uh, just threw in the towel. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a, a political question first. Is this uh, to destroy the Trump administration? No. No, I think is that the Fed... Is it because, is because uh, Jerome Powell is not as smart as he thinks he is? No. 
What's they the are reason? as smart as they think they are. Never underestimate them. <laughs> so what, 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 why would he do that? Uh, the Fed thinks of itself as, as beyond this administration or that administration. It thinks of itself as above government. I know they like to think of themselves as that way. but And they do. And they, they are this omnipotent force that's accountable to no one. So we were talking about, in an earlier show, we were talking about why wages stopped in the 70s. And when you think about what the Fed's statement is, and the whole Fed rationale, not its reason, but its rationale, is that, gee, the economy is doing well, the unemployment rate is really low, therefore the competition for workers must be really fierce, they're going to, make wa they're going to have wage gains, these workers, and if they have wage gains, they're going to go out and spend it, and that's going to cause inflation, which is our mandate. There's no mandate against prosperity. So the Fed is proactively, preemptively uh, attempting to stop something that at best had, they have, at worst they have a three-year time horizon to figure it out. Wages never have Okay, moved. well let's, let's kind of go back to basics. Uh, prior to 1913, for about 124 years, we operated fairly successfully as a country without any federal bank, what's, federal reserve bank whatsoever, no central bank whatsoever. Uh, the Federal Reserve was started in 1913. Uh, before 1913, going back to the uh, second national bank that, uh, that uh, Jackson ran out of town, no, no, you know, no central bank. It was uh, local banks competing with each other. You had business cycles that went up and down, but nothing compared to the Great Depression of the 1930s or the Greater Depression of the, of, you know, following 2008. And now, with a central bank, with one person setting the price of money, or one board setting the price of money, we have much worse depressions than we did prior to the Federal Reserve, and we have a greater dichotomy of income. Two, thi two, you know, two unfortunate things have happened. Uh, the, the rich are getting rich at the expense of the poor, uh, ostensibly, and the, re and the recessions are, the, or depressions are getting, are getting worse than they were prior to the central bank. I would posit that money, or interest rates, are the price of money. I mean, ipso facto, if interest rate is, is, is the cost of borrowing. It's probably the most important price in the economy. No other price is more important than the cost of borrowing because that controls consumption patterns, it controls investment patterns, and it, 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 you know, it's, the, it's the linchpin to whether a market economy is functioning properly, market signals are getting read properly, and so forth. As an empirical matter, we know, as libertarians, that pay attention to these things, that price controls, wage controls, don't ever work as expected. Price controls have failed for centuries. They have never, ever accomplished what they're supposed to accomplish. So what do we do? We put a price control on the most important price in the economy, the federal or the interest rate, and we expect good things to happen? Well, and just to get an idea of the scale of it, uh, the Fed has raised interest rates. Uh, U.S. households are, uh, by the latest numbers, just out, say, you know, less than a month ago. U.S. households are uh, have uh, about thirteen and a half trillion dollars of debt. Their mortgages, their credit cards, their car loans, etc. Uh, you put uh, the Fed has raised interest rates uh, two percent over the last two years, which means that on that debt, it has destroyed approximately a half a trillion dollars of household wealth. Uh, th th this is money, you know, you sit at the kitchen table yeah, and, and you, you know, realize and, and, Which is kind of a number that goes over my head. How much per household has it, has it well, do the math, how much, how, do the arithmetic, how much per household wealth has it destroyed? About $3,000 be... a year. Okay, there you go. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at this from the standpoint that A, the, you know, one person or one board is not going to do as good a job at setting the price of money as the market would. Just not going to. Just not going to happen. Uh, and it's going to have secondary effects. The problem that the the Fed was trying to solve during the 1930s was one of slow growth depression. You know, uh, lower, uh, follow, uh, dropping prices. They didn't. See, they did. They didn't really succeed. The problem the Fed was trying to cure in 2008 was a problem ultimately of too much debt. We had too much money being lent 
to people who were in the, in the real estate market, to people who are not able uh, ultimately to pay off their, to pay their home loans, to keep, you know, to keep from going underwater. So we're, we have a problem of too much debt. The Fed solves that problem by increasing the amount of debt through quantitative easing and lower interest rates. And, uh, you know, on and the other what, side. what happens? So we have a whole lot more debt now than we did in 2008. At the federal government level, at the business level, we've got a whole lot of bond issuance going out at just barely above junk rating, just barely investment grade. And we have a student loan uh, debt balloon, which is not dischargeable in bankruptcy and which is being used in large part to finance uh, degrees that are not worth a whole heck of a lot in, in the marketplace. And we have uh, record uh, amounts of, uh, of uh, car loans going out, as well as the real estate bubble is starting to pop up again. Everyone thinks this time it's not going to be the housing and everyone thinks it's going to be the corporate uh, corporate debt, uh, because once again, we have done derivatives of debt. Yeah. And what happened was all uh, the interest rates were so low uh, coming out of the financial collapse that it made more sense, even for a company as profitable as Apple that had no debt uh, and was just a cash cow, yet it was using debt to fund its operations because interest was deductible in the U.S., whereas the corporate tax rate was 40%. And so when you have a company that's sitting on $250 billion in cash, what do you want to do? Do you want to give away $100 billion of it in taxes? Or do you want to get a deduction and fund all of your operations by taking on debt? So that as we sat today, Apple has been issuing bonds all over the world. But Apple is now has as much debt as it has cash. So as the interest rates are rising, those debts are starting to roll over and the derivative that happened was a, a company that had zero cash and a billion dollars in debt went to someone and said let me borrow a billion dollars now they've got a billion dollars in cash on their balance sheet from what they borrowed and they're two billion in debt well that doesn't sound so bad so they went out and said hey look i got a billion dollars in cash on my balance sheet can i borrow two billion from you so now this company has really borrowed five billion has no cash of its own but it has money on the balance sheet ostensibly. Well, obviously, when that money starts to you hit the recession times, as you know, the numbers I just stated earlier, we're there. Uh, those companies start to lose their revenue, inability to make the loans. It's not a billion going south; it's five billion. Well, not only that, but when they have to roll that debt over as the bonds mature. They're doing it at a higher interest rate. And they can't do it. And they're going to be downrated by Moody's and Standards and Poor's from to, to, to junk. And once that happens, guess who can't buy those bonds anymore? Pension right. funds, uh, insurance companies, any number of institutional investors can no longer buy those bonds, at which point the bond prices go south. And, right then it, and, then it, and then it affects the banks because, once again, we have the run on the banks where nobody knows what the liability, nobody knew what Bear or Lehman, uh, who, who they owed money to and who owed money to them or whether they were going to be able to collect the money. And that's what the end game of the corporate debt bubble, as it were, uh, would be is that, once again, you'd have a run on the banks. And, of course, part of the money that was being borrowed by corporations was being borrowed for the sole purpose of buying back stock exactly. to pump up the uh, stock market prices. This is, uh, I mean, I can't help but thinking of this entire maze that we've gone through here and when we think that, you know, so, some smart guy, you know, sitting in, in one office or, you know, maybe it's a president who, who really wants to push it another way. You know, the bottom line is the, the idea to think that, that one guy is going to sit here and move everything like chess pieces and know how everybody's going to react. And of course, it's this complex web that of reactions that occurs. It was funny too because when you said uh, uh, price controls never work as planned, and it's funny for you know libertarian free market principles, they they always fail exactly as we understand them. <laughs> it's not a matter of not working as planned. And it's amazing how, um, especially at the corporate level, they respond. Data just out just now that uh, when the Fed made that comment, the first month that we could track was uh, the November. Uh, Fed uh, corporate buybacks hit an all-time record in November, $200 billion. <laughs> At the same time, that was the month that corporations stopped repatriating their money altogether. So there has been a great incentive for companies to say, okay, it's not a, you know, it's not a tax 
break. It's a normal tax rate. Uh, but it was enough to say these corporations could bring their money from overseas. It wasn't a terrible tax. It was, you know, 15.7 percent, their effective tax rate rather than 40 percent. So they were doing it. But when the election happened and when the Fed said, you know, once this money is here, look out, they stopped. They said, we're keeping it over there. And we are not going to invest in anything. We're going to buy back our shares. That's the only thing we can do with our money. And so the, the effect that the Fed has throughout society, you know, there are people, when I talk about it to clients, their eyes start to glaze over when you talk about the Fed. And I just say, look at your credit card statement. You know, it's higher, isn't it? <laughs> you know, your interest rate is higher, isn't it? You've got to pay that, right? So you're not going to do this, are you? That's what, that's what it means. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so uh, now that we have uh, sliced and diced the Fed, <coughs> give us the rosy outlook. Uh, the rosy outlook uh, goes something like this. Uh, we're going to be 18 months in a, in a recession. It's a question of how bad, and yesterday it looks like it'll be a real bad one, uh, on the order of 7, 07 to 09. What I also think is going to happen, and this may be the ultimate benefit, is that it's so apparently the Fed. You know, in the last crisis, there were a lot of people to blame, and nobody pointed a finger at the Fed. Uh, this time, there's nobody else to blame but the Fed. And, uh, you know, there was a nascent movement that died in 2016 to either reduce the Fed to nothing uh, or eliminate it altogether. Uh, and so I think that, you know, with Trump making such a public uh, stink about what the Fed is doing, with so many people scratching their heads about what the Fed is doing because nobody can figure out you know, why they're doing what they're doing. It's not economic, obviously, uh, that it may very well be the end of the Fed. If, uh, if it should so happen that Trump got reelected, uh, then you know, his first thing is going to be to nominate a new, uh, re-nominate this chair or nominate a new one. And I, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised with all the damage that Powell has personally done to every other part of his agenda that the first thing he's going to do is see Dan Doesn't, the doesn't he have a fixed term? A uh, four-year fixed term that gets re-nominated right after the president is oh, interesting, elected. Interesting. So I think that this, uh, this, this may have been the Waterloo for the Fed. Uh, and Will Ron they, Paul finally get his way and end the Fed? I think, I think that they really did break it this time. Well, maybe. We'll see. The Senate passed the Senate passed criminal justice reform. I, it hasn't I, I gone through the House quite yet, but it looks like it probably will. Tell us a little bit, Jason, about criminal justice reform, why it is a really, really good step in the right direction that Trump has promised to sign. Well, uh, the, the key thing that uh, criminal justice reform looks to be doing is to uh, reduce some of these uh, uh, mandatory minimums uh, for uh, drug crimes and, uh, you know, reduce uh, some of the uh, sentences for people who were uh, sentenced for, uh, I guess, to some of these disproportionate sentences from crack cocaine, I believe, and other things. So essentially it's really digging in on reducing some of the burdens that the uh, drug war has put on the prison system, it sounds like. And that's, uh, for the most part, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and it'll certainly reduce some of the costs that we have in that system by, by trying to find ways other than just to to throw a lot of these people who are really, you know, just uh, many of them just doing something that uh, affected themselves, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, some drug-related crime, you know, that uh, being in jail for something like that. And they did a couple of head-scratching things, too. Head-scratching and what? They actually did that? Feminine products will now be available to women. Women who are pregnant will no longer have to be shackled. And... Uh, Prisoners will now be in prison no more than 500 miles from their from their homes, so their families can come visit. Crash, scratch my head. They were actually doing things like that. Evidently, they were. Uh, and you know, it's it's there. It's small steps, small steps in the right direction. And it was divided government, interestingly enough, that was that made it possible. House controlled uh, now by the by the Democrats. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, kudos to the president on this one. I, I never would have thought I, I would see it. He got it passed in, in spite of the poison pills that uh, guys like Tom Cotton tried to throw, in, throw into the to, to monkey wrenches with. Um, full withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. Uh, that's, you know, making news this week. Is that actually going to happen? Or is this just uh, 
uh, Bush is standing on the uh, ship and saying, "We've, you know, we, uh, we won the war." I forget what he said, but uh, uh, mission, mission accomplished. accomplished. Yeah, mission accomplished. Right. Yeah. We, you, you'd almost wonder if, uh, with these last two stories, if Trump has become a libertarian. <laughs> I, you know, I, you know, only, only by accident if it happened, but you know, we'll take accidents anyway. Uh, well, I was uh, just thinking, I mean, you know, Ron Paul, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, put out one of the most coherent foreign policies, and that's it. You know, why are we getting ourselves involved in so many other people's business? And, you know, he's saying that uh, he believes the mission with ISIS is accomplished over there, so it's time to take the troops home. And, and it just seems like everywhere in the world, past administrations want to just leave troops everywhere and to have us be the world. And you know what's really interesting is the bipartisan opposition that he stirred up. Republicans you know, are, are going nuts. The neocons are saying, oh my God, this is going to be absolutely horrendous. And the Democrats are piling on and saying this is not, you know, not thought out properly. He, you know, this is wrong. This is going to be very, very dangerous. What's the worst that could happen? Well, we have kept troops on the ground at, at infinitum. Read Afghanistan, 17 years now. Still no resolution to the to the conflict. Iraq nearly as long. I think it's I, a government think, jobs program. <laughs> it, well, exactly. Well, government jobs and, you know, indu you know uh, military, industrial, and now intelligence surveillance uh, uh, complex writ large. Well, and you look at uh, 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 the band of Africa, the central band of Africa, east to west, a uh, string of U.S. military, they don't call them bases, they call them something else, some other euphemism, they're bases. And the whole thing has been, you know, why the progressives, the progressives are the party of empire. They're Teddy Roosevelt. They are, let's, you know, let's make America the... The great you know, white fleet. The, uh, so it is consistent with progressive philosophy to um, uh, favor empire. And so when you look at strategically where as we have... As long as they're in control of the empire. Exactly. Uh, and so... Um, uh, it is, uh, when we look at some of these huge wars, uh, and who started them? Woodrow Wilson, you know, progressive, started World War I. And arguably one. without, there was no need for the U.S. to ever be in World War I. There was, it would have been fought to a tie, and the world history would have been a terrible tie, but a tie, which would have re uh, prevented the reparations, which in turn would have prevented the rise of Hitler, which would have in, per in turn prevented... World War II, and if not for our embargo of Japan, you know, blah, blah, blah. So which, which was also got us involved by another progressive. Exactly. When the so, sad thing is, this, I mean, we just see this over and over again, like with the past story on the Fed, you know, uh, a few people thinking that we can control everything by moving a few chess pieces around on the board, and there's all these unintended consequences of just making people angry everywhere and leading to a lot of terrorism. And, you know, I, I can't help but thinking, too, with the drone strike, if, if if I were to see my neighbor's house just blow up one day and get a message from China that, uh, don't worry, this was a uh, bad guy who was an enemy of the people of China, go about your business and, and everything will be all right, I think I'd be pretty alarmed and I, you know, and, and China might label me a terrorist, you know, yeah. <laughs> in case. Yeah. So you might I be one. Just, you know, know, air, you air, know, aircraft you carrier know, uh, 30 miles yeah, off the coast of New York. Depending on who said you are, you're a terrorist or a freedom fighter. Sure, exactly. So, uh, uh, and, and he did get uh, flack on both sides. It's 2,000 troops. It's not, you know, uh, it's not a big thing. The fact, it seems to me, when you think about it all, wherever we have been, we've been at war with Iran for about 50 years, and all of these are just theaters of operation. Yeah, I mean, the, the war in the Middle East are fundamentally Sunni Shiite and then also anti-Israel. And the, you know they're tribals. The, you know you've got you've got they're tribal wars. They're 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 religious sects that can't get along with each other, and are trying to dominate a piece of real estate. Yeah. And it's not our real estate, so it's not our business to try to figure out uh, who should prevail on that real estate dispute. And uh, whoever ends up owning the real estate under which there is oil, you can pretty well bet they're still going to sell us oil. Well, and the heck of it is, is they don't sell us oil. And the fact is, well, is the U.S., if there's really no economic interest other than strategic positioning. Uh, the U.S. is the number one oil-producing nation in the world. Uh, Russia is number two. Uh, the Saudis are a distant third. Uh, and the fact is, is that uh, uh, supply and demand, tr we're trying to figure out how we can cut supply to meet demand, because to uh, falling demand. 
uh, and that oil is in secular decline anyway. The, uh, most of the Middle East oil now is used in the Middle East it's, uh, to fund their own social programs. It's uh, mostly internal now. Uh, and who needs oil? South America doesn't need oil. They've got Brazil, Venezuela. Uh, well, and, and we've become a net uh, energy exporter, as far as I understand, you know, yep. with all of the natural gas production and everything. Natural so, gas, fracking, yeah. yep. so on. Uh, the, su the Supreme Court has legalized, uh, or back in May, legalized uh, sports betting. Well, it's about time. It's about time that I can actually legally bet on uh, the Yankees. To, well, I don't bet, but I don't. I don't follow sports, but. But some people uh, can bet on their, their favorite sports teams. But now Senators Schumer and Hatch, always it's bipartisan when bad things start to happen. Well, not always, but they're anyway, they're hatching federal regulatory schemes to regulate sports betting. Uh, what, what's that going to look like? Uh, taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact is, I mean, sports betting is right up there with uh, the oldest profession. Uh, and you can make it legal, you can make it illegal, it's still going to happen. Uh, you know, I can remember my father and his friend with the cards, the football sheets, and, uh, you know, my son sends me his football picks every week. Uh, fo you know, sports betting has been one of those wink and nod things. We say it's illegal, the fact is everybody does it, but it gives us the right to arrest somebody uh, when we feel like it. One, uh, more, one more topic I want to throw out there for just your... your, your First reaction, Elon Musk has uh, tested his boring tunnel, and I understand it was a rocky or a mumpy ride. Well, it, it, they built about a mile in, on their uh, company's property, I believe, in Texas, I think. And, uh, no, California. Oh, oh, it was in California. Oh, okay, yeah. okay yeah. so it's actually there. And uh, the, the plan is to be able to put these things in L.A. Uh, underneath the city and be able to have a high-speed network of cars that... Uh, uh, essentially to, to have these uh, Teslas and other automotive cars that will be able to take people at uh, various different levels underground at, at high speed uh, to destinations and, and cut a lot of the uh, gridlock that's going on on the surface roads. And uh, I mean, it sounds like another innovative idea from uh, Elon Musk. Um, and, uh, one of the things I guess that uh, uh, they were uh, experimenting with, it looks like the cars are going to have these extra wheels that flip out from the front and grab onto the sides of the, of the tunnels. But I guess it'll be open to all of the automated uh, uh, or autonomous cars, rather. So. Interesting, interesting, futuristic guy. I wonder <laughs> whether it will be as uh, financially successful as Tesla. We'll see. That's the show for this week. See you again next week on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Okay,